Hello and welcome to this episode of Fintech Focus TV, brought to you by Harrington Star, global leaders in financial technology recruitment. Head over to the Harrington Star website today where you'll be able to download our brand new documentary, The Era of Convergence, which charts the merger of traditional and decentralized finance. You'll also be able to see our new magazine, The Financial Technologist, with the Top 1% Workplace Awards. Enjoy the show and we'll see you soon. Another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am absolutely delighted to bring you an introduction to Dante Syracuse over at Carter Worldwide out in San Francisco. Dante, how are you? I'm doing well. Good morning or afternoon to you. It's a little bit both for either of us, isn't it? It's, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that East Coast time zone or West Coast time zone is uh, an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us so so early and uh, enjoyed the preamble so far. We've been talking a little bit about the uh, uh, the business and what we're going to be talking about today, and I think it's really, really valuable, particularly at the moment. We're in a stage where we're seeing enormous volatility in marketplaces. I think just about every uh, country in the world is going to be talking about some sort of recession at some sort of stage, if not already there um, within it. And that has implications into the payments world that I think has been really, really interesting for a while anyway. So lots and lots to uh, to dig into, and we're going to even move into the world of blockchain and, and uh, my personal pet projects as we were talking about beforehand as well. So a lot, a lot of things to cover. But before we do in, uh, do that, can you give us a brief introduction about yourself, Dante, and talk to us a little bit about Carter Worldwide as well? Yeah, certainly. So um, I've been in the payment space for coming up on two decades now. Um, I've worked everywhere from prepaid debit in the early days of web banking when that was novel, all the way through to the global acquiring platforms doing um solutions consulting for different companies, global companies wanting to do new acquiring methods in different countries. Um, and then I uh, went back over to the issuer processing side and um, I headed up a sales engineering group for um, a little company called Marketa and then moved over to Carta Worldwide, um, a competitor to Marketa in, in many ways. Um, at Carta Worldwide, we, um, do issuer processing. We're heavily focused in the uh, European and UK space right now. Uh, we're headquartered officially in Toronto, and we are dipping our toes a bit in the US. Um, but overall, we are working with a lot of um, B2B type services, um, different middleware platforms as that issuer processing engine underneath what those services are that they offer out to their users. So a lot of it has to do with making sure we stay up to speed with um, different schemes and how schemes are connecting and enabling the features that they bring uh, to the ecosystem and making it easily available by way of API structuring so our customers can build out a solution that makes sense for them and their end users as well. That's fascinating. And I, I think what's really interesting there is you say it's Toronto-based business focusing on the uh, on on, your, on the, the a lot of focus on the UK and Europe with yeah. a, uh, a a CPO based in San Francisco with a toe in the water in the US tell us about how it's all set up yeah so it gets a little bit crazier than that um, <laughs> parent company in Vancouver headquartered in Toronto for sales and commercials um, UK operations and then technology centers in North Africa in Casablanca and I am the lone American in, um, in the organization. I think really it came about because I, when I came across, it was to help them get into the U.S., start building out um, offerings in the U.S., and that's kind of worked itself out. So I do this crazy 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. schedule. So I get up at like 3.20 every morning so I can have my meetings with my technology groups in Morocco at, at their noon time. It, it's a little crazy, just, just, just <laughs> it's a little crazy. But um, the company was originally founded in Switzerland and had a UK, or sorry, had a European footprint. And then as time evolved over the last 12 years, it has kind of spread its footprint globally. Yeah, I think I think the interesting thing about payments, isn't it, is is, is it's just such a um, it's such an international uh, arena, isn't it? And so, you know, if you if you're looking at there about how global it can be, and I guess the, the clues in the name Carter Worldwide, isn't it? Is the the, mm -hmm. the scale of opportunities is so enormous, 
how do you guys look at it? And, and you know, if, you, if you've got a UK and European market, I imagine that's a fragment of what the potential is for the US. And, and that, that creates a massive opportunity for you as well, I, I take it. It does. It's, it's really interesting when you look at the total market, because this is where the acquiring side of my world blends with the issuing side of my world. On the acquiring side, you have to have consumers wanting to pay with some methodology that they can trust. How do they trust it? Some places it's still cash, some places it's cards, and other places it's direct debit, right? So when you look at what's going to make that consumer happy, you also have to understand what's going to make the merchants happy. You know, how, what are they willing to do? How much cash are they willing to take in? Um, and then when you look at the scheme schemes that are out there, you have localized schemes that are catering to that local um, consumer who is comfortable with that method. Uh, but then you have the Visa, MasterCards, Diners, JCMB, all the others who really have to build a rail and an infrastructure in order to deal with the variations. Um, because at the end of the day, the rails that the schemes provide, the platforms that Cardo Worldwide provides, um, even the even the acquiring side of the house, it's not about us. We're messengers. All we do is we take information and we pass it back and forth. And then we work with the banks to make sure the money follows the messages, right? Mm. Everybody mm. has to be in sync. Having things like ISO 8583, like the common messaging standard for right now, um, everybody has to be on board. And it's something that I run into on the API side as well. It's if you want to do something new and innovative, but you're, you're handcuffed or um, chained to an old platform or an old technology or an old messaging schema, you have to figure out how to take that data and do something different with the data, whether that data funds an experience for a user or whether the data just simply captures information that you regurgitate back out. If you're just doing that, you're a commodity. If you're taking that data and doing something different and exciting with it to either fuel something else or provide insights, then you're an innovator. But at the end of the day, it all sits on the same communication channels. The same language is being used underneath. And um, I think it's really interesting how everybody tries to use the same language and get and try to get into that messaging flow so they become a mouth that gets fed. Yeah. You know, that's kind of how I see it. So it's, it's um, a, yeah, it's a, I've always thought it's a fascinating ecosystem, isn't it? And there's, a, yeah. there's so many different areas. And it probably, as, as I alluded to earlier on, we brought into even more of a focus as we enter a... Um, yeah, uh, this 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 global recession cloud that we're mm -hmm. we're looking at, and and obviously there's a, I don't think there's any economist in the world who agrees with the the depth or severity or time or distance of it of it all. But the 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 you know what's what's I think it's fairly universal is we're in it for a while, um, no matter how deep or shallow it, it may be. You know, there's right. there's not there's not a quick way out of that. We're talking about cost of living crisis over here in the UK. Uh, you know, hyperinflation inflation in, in most parts of it, although hopefully tailing off on a global level at the, at the moment from uh, stuff that I've been reading reading today, which casts a really interesting space. It's got an opportunity for uh, for, for payments to cut, sort of enter stage right as the hero here, hasn't it? Tell, tell me a little bit about um, you know, the landscape and what we can expect to see at the moment. What's, what's interesting in the space? Yeah, so a couple things about payments right now, um, you know, the industry moves in moves in waves. So basically, you know, when I when I look at it, the we're so pinned to the economies globally that we're going to watch spend and savings just co constantly oscillate. Right. The easier it is to spend, the better it's going to be for the consumer because they'll be able to have access to things that they normally wouldn't have. Whether it's something from a local mom and pop store or something from you know, a drop shipment company based out of Taiwan or whatever it is, as long as we can move that money around and get the messages around, it'll be great for the consumer. What's going to be interesting is as the inflation starts setting in luxury, not luxury items, um, wants kind of wane as needs take priority um, and people will start holding on to their actual cash or value behind the payments. Mm -hmm. That's where things become interesting because that opens up consumers to just focus on necessities that are becoming more expensive, right? As our cost of goods um, go up because of the inflations and hyperinflations. Um, I think we're going to start seeing people potentially, there are two, two groups, right? You're gonna have some people who um, are doing well, 
who want to use credit cards because they'll get the points and they can pay it off fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be running up a huge amount of debt. Um, and they're still being rewarded because they're the haves, right? Then there are the have nots. They're not going to want to use credit because they want to stay within their means. And then there's another group. And that's mm -hmm. the other group who is like, I have no choice but to use credit, get a loan, buy now, pay later, um, pay in four, like all of these other variations that are out there. And those groups are the most impacted by this, in, in my opinion, um, as far as it relates to necessities. We're providing tools that can help people in a pinch. What we can account for is the mindset of the consumer or their individual situation. So when we have people who are already in debt, suddenly prices go up, they're having trouble making ends meet right now, they'll be more willing to use buy now, pay later. They'll be more willing to open up their, um, their wallet and grab their credit cards or tap their credit cards or use their watch or whatever it is. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, they're buying into their own risk is what it is. What that does to the industry is it creates a couple of different opportunities. You're going to see FIs or financial institutions out there who are going to try to help people and protect people. You're going to see FIs that are like, we're simply facilitators. And then you're going to see FIs who may be nefarious in nefarious without being illegal, let's say that, mm -hmm. that they're going to say, oh, the payments opportunity just opened up. We're going to make a lot of money on these people. Yeah, right? yeah. So what's the intention of the FI? What experience does the FI want to drive? Is it a trusted advisor? Is it an educator? Is it a facilitator? Or is it somebody who's going to take advantage of a situation that the entire world is feeling pressure on, right? Mm. And those folks who are the have-nots are going to feel squeezed by that. That's that's kind of a, a bigger take on it. And now I'm kind of I, I don't know. I I want to be the I want to be the trusted advisor. I want to be the yeah. guy who helps educate people. Like it's the Boy Scout in me coming out where I'm like, we can do so much. <laughs> good right now let's not let the industry do bad right because well, that's that's 100 the right you know the, the, the right way to look at it isn't it you you, we, you spoke about this and teed it up as opportunity and i think in every marketplace there's opportunity there are people there who you know if, if we look at the pandemic in recent times there was there was so many strong things that happened you know yeah. uh, in terms of business process after the pandemic which created a much better thing from you know, the, the, the boom in hybrid work and, and what it did for work-life balance from, from there through to, you know, the rapid evolution of digital technology within financial services through to yeah. how payments effectively allow people to to survive in, in many different areas. It was, it created itself and painted itself. I think this, this sector as something that really drove positive change within it. Right now, as you're looking at, at something there where, where, again, it has the opportunity to do it, you're quite right. There are two different schools of thought about how this can go. And I would say that the the whole, the whole you know, BNPL world has yeah. managed to paint itself into into you know despite its its fairly noble uh, origins, it's managed to paint itself into a fairly sinister and macabre uh, corner at various different stages with uh, you know with some fairly high profile um, you know schemes that that made it very difficult for people to get out of their debt. And I think you can you know we we, we spoke a little bit earlier on about traditional markets and and decentralized markets, and we'll come on to that in a, in a minute converging to create a much yep. more stabilized uh, opportunity. I think right now you're probably looking in this particular space as another as another area where good can prevail in this because it needs to, because the the the, the ramifications of it doing bad in that sort of scenario and people having the advantage of taking out them when they're at the most vulnerable, is just almost incomprehensible really, right? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, when I think about BNPL, it, it's funny that we've had all of these fads and payments, right? <laughs> new things come up. First, it was web banking. Well, not first. A long time ago, it was web banking. Then, oh, everything's going to be credit-based. Oh, two, then we had the 2008 um, issues here in the U.S. Um, with financial collapse a little bit. Um, and then there was the protect the consumer. CFPB came in on our side. And I'm sure, yeah. and I don't remember all the terms on the other side or the other acronyms from other countries, but basically it's, uh-oh, Consumers are being taken advantage of because they don't understand the the markets, the financial impacts of what's happening, and we kind of, we became stable, 
things became pretty good for a while. And then all of a sudden, buy now, pay later came out. It's an excellent product for people who understand how to manage their money or understand the impacts. What's, what's interesting to me is in some ways, buy now, pay later is convenient. It's done in Brazil all the time. Paying for has always been a big thing like down in Brazil for, you know, for decades. So it's not completely novel on the global scene of payments, but it is in the, in Europe, in the US, Canada, Australia, these markets are really starting to open up with buy now, pay later. This is where middlemen come in. This is the interesting part. If you go to say in a firm um, or a Klarna, one of the others, you can effectively stack payments and mm. stacking or stacking loans or stacking payments is something that used to happen in payday lending. Um, back in the day where payday lending, you know, hey, you're in a crunch, come down, you know, we'll give you a loan, pay us back on payday, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. That's how, and then all of a sudden you get people stacking loans, right? Because not enough of these loans are being reported to credit bureaus, are not showing up. And then you have multiple lenders putting themselves in jeopardy because they're taking on a risk or a liability that this person is going to pay back. Well, buy now, pay later can be that same way. You need that middleman, that regulation somewhere in there because if it was just a firm doing it and just Klarna doing it, that's not so bad, right? Yeah. But now there are you know, a plethora of opportunities to start getting more buy now, pay laters. And it's fun, you get a buy now, pay later and it's $15 a month for four months. That's great, you do that 10 times. Uh, you know, something yeah, like fifty dollars a month, and if if your total your total um, discretionary spending is five hundred dollars, well, you just hosed yourself, right? Mm. Because how are you going to buy food and gas during inflation times while also paying off these these stacks of buy now pay later's? Um, I used to I used to joke because I'm. I'm cruel and callous sometimes. I'm like, yeah, when we look at <laughs> trends of payments, you know, we have cryptos coming up and now all of a sudden we have like NFTs, we have buy now, pay later. I go, the next trend is going to be basically payment recovery companies, you yeah. know, collections agencies on the heels of, of buy now, pay later, because how are they going to get their money back? Because at some point, the business plan associated with the risk for buy now pay later for these individual companies will not be able to account for the mass failings of people to pay back in time so is That's that going to be the new trend we're going to have collections tech coming in you know like you know and like what's it going to look like and of course i'm saying this jokingly but there's some potential truth there in the sense that consumers just don't understand the mechanics it's complex mm. And governments step in a lot of times to protect consumers from predators, right? And even when companies aren't being predators, they might get labeled that way. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing happened in the payday lending markets a long time ago, um, where there were people really doing good. The intention was good, doing lending, and they were doing it right with the underwritings, all good. But then there was everybody else who were like, oh, we can make a lot of money here, you know, so let's, let's do that. And my and my my gut tells me at the moment that there is that there is an appetite for people to do good here at the at the moment. And you, but the, yeah, the issue the issue is is that it's, it's you know the uh, you know the small minority that create you know create create the issue. But there seems to be I, I don't know if I'm romanticising this because obviously you know, the payday lending boom sorry should I say got some very very negative press and created a lot of uh, you know a lot of issues behind it as well as a lot of success stories i mean it helps a lot of people out of binds as well in, in its more noble sense so 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 tell me how that's avoided this time we we, we know the issue we know the the appetite i do think there is a, a i do you know, as, as bizarre as this is going to sound i do think there's a more noble financial services market than we've ever seen before um I agree. Per, per, perhaps you know owing to uh yeah you know, to 2008 and and i think you know uh, you know, I, I say that with everything that, that we've seen at FTX and various issues are, are around that coming up recently, where there's still, you know, uh, there's still things to flush out the system. But I do think it's been, you know, but from from 2020 onwards, particularly with, you know, how the robust financial markets probably saved the uh, the infrastructure of most developed countries at that sort of stage. There is a more noble cause. But what do you think we need to see at the moment? There, there are two important things: <clears throat> a mechanism for these BNPLs to register and be, car be a part of um, knowledge sharing, make sure 
that they're using the same type of tools to be able to cross report, um, you know, who's getting loans and what their, their payback or success rate is, things like that would be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. That would be a big part of it, making sure they're all on the same page. Then comes the other piece. The only way they're going to be on the same page is for regulators to say, this is how you're going to be on the same page. Right. Yeah. And yeah. we have to have the tools in place. Um, and it gets into, I mean, the regulation thing is the same thing that we can talk about with cryptocurrencies as well. It's it's a matter of these are new, innovative things to some, some governments. Like I said, Brazil has been doing this forever. But for the U.S. as a market or U.K. as a market, regulators haven't been exposed to this. They're still trying to figure out the ramifications. And the only way they're going to do that, it's kind of like um, when you're fighting fraud you can only mitigate what you know is going to happen. Mm. But you, it's very difficult to hire really good people to think of really bad ways to take, a, take advantage of somebody and then put a rule in place just in case. Right. Well, this is this is this is the kind of Frank Abagnale thing, wasn't it? With uh, Catch Me If You Can, <laughs> the movie yeah. around there. Sort of that, put the uh, put the put the bad guy on the inside and and so, you know, think with a different mindset because that <laughs> that's where it is. The the ability to exploit situations with with a with a criminal mindset is uh, is something that I just think is very very difficult for a regulator to understand. And that comes into this whole crypto world as you, as you alluded to before. Oh, is, yeah. is the is the regulator quite frankly the regulators won't be able to understand it in 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 loads of different areas it's not an easily regulated area and when you right. talk about it how it comes into you know payments that you know to me the, the the magic word in all of this is trust transparency and trust are the two are the two watch words for, for all of this and and crypto as much you know th throughout has always had its you know it, when it when you look at its uh it's roots that sort of come into money laundering and and uh, you know uh, you know, funding all of that lose right. all of the, the sort of benefits you can have from you know from a collective blockchain to ease friction in the system that make it just easier for everyone to uh, you know, to transact you know successfully and the, and if you look at a use case of what it can do with with payment services it can be completely revolutionary but it needs that regulatory uh, piece for it. it has you know implications around that as well spread some light on what your what your views are around that that sort of area because it's a, it's you know it's so interesting isn't it this this is one of my favorite areas to talk about if i had a magic wand cryptocurrency would never exist but the but the technology would yeah i am a fan of the technology I'm building rails on that technology would be amazing but the currency elements of it this is where things get complicated. If you have a current, well, I've seen a couple of very large companies try to do one ubiquitous um, cryptocurrency to make all of their countries tie together, one uniform platform for all payments. It's all great and magical. They couldn't get regulators to buy it, right? Because mm. banks didn't understand it. So there's been a, like the last four or five years, banks are crypto adjacent, right? Mm. They don't know where the money's coming from. There's too much anonymity. It goes, it flies in the face of like the US Patriot Act and all of our AML, KYC things. Like crypto's scary to banks because mm. they don't want to be the ones supporting a program and not know where the money's coming from or going to because our mm. regulators have made it that way, which is good for the purpose of anti terrorism, anti money laundering, all good stuff. But if you're a private investor and you have your own assets and your own holdings and you want to give your kid $10,000, okay, here, here's a, here's a third of a Bitcoin right now. Um, mm -hmm. It used to be a sixth, but then some people sent some tweets out and that all fell apart. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, there, that anonymity piece is really one of the biggest things that drives that cryptocurrency element of it is I don't want people to know what I'm doing. It's that libertarianism mm -hmm. that a lot of people have. But the problem is there are too many people who don't understand it, who jump into the into the fray and in the din of excitement, lose their life savings because mm. they didn't understand the risk, right? CFPB again, goes back to Consumer fi Financial Protection Board or Bureau, one of those Bs. Um, sorry, I can't remember all my acronyms. Um, <laughs> they're there to protect the, the consumer. Right. So when we think about payment methodology and how money moves in the world, they want to make sure people are protected. They want to make sure governments are protected. They want to make sure their allies are protected. And at the end of the day, they also want to get paid. 
Yeah. We need to be able to see how the money moves and we need to be able to account for it. If it's more than whatever the, the tariff values are or the exchange values are, you know, they want their piece. They want to be a part of it. On crypto, for me, this is something I've always struggled with with crypto. You cannot pay somebody a Bitcoin through conventional rails. And it goes back to the regulatory elements. Banks don't want the risk, right? You effectively have an asset that needs to be liquidated. And then you can take that, that fiat currency, whatever it's been liquidated to, and use that as a payment piece, right? The only time that we may be able to do true crypto to crypto would be these um, peg USDCs or mm. the yen DC, you know, where, where you actually have it pegged to a certain dollar value. Then in, for me, I kind of look at that and go, well, why? That becomes one more code on an FX table that we're going to have to do a conversion on to make sure that we're getting the appropriate market value on the days, blah, blah, blah. Right. So why, you know, why do that when, but the other side of it is the volatility in the currency in digital currency right now, you know, it's scary. It's, it's, I look at it and I see a security like a stock or a bond. Um, but it's unregulated. It's gunslinger territory where um, you can have somebody who says, my car company is going to accept this currency. And suddenly this, the value of that currency goes up and that guy sells off a ton of that currency once it's been inflated. And then the next day says, oh, just kidding. We're going to use this other one. And then the price just bottoms out, right? In the securities world, that was a stock. Oh my gosh. I mean, there would be jail time, you know, yeah. it, it would be yeah, jail time. So what is a cryptocurrency? It's not a currency because you have to sell it to spend it, right? And it's not a stock because, well, it's a private asset. It's not a part of the global or a, some form of company that's been listed somewhere. So the regulators don't know how to deal with that. And I think that instability and the desire for it to be anonymous really is what's causing a lot of the issues that we're finding. I mean, FTX is a great example of that. You know, trust us. We're going to take in all your money. We'll hold it all. It'll be fine. And, yeah, yeah. oh, by it's the way, like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oops, sorry. Yeah. We don't have protections in place because nobody told us we had to have protections in place. Right? So as it's much the as stunning, It's the stunning naivety that they're sort of uh, portraying, isn't it? Because you're absolutely oh, right. You know, Yes. If you've got if you've got a regulated environment, you haven't got the opportunity to to say I'm just I'm too young to have thought about this or I didn't realize you weren't allowed to do X or or, right. or Y or Z. I mean, it's a stunning defense. It really it, it genuinely is a, 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 around that. And I think um yeah, this is this is why I think it's such a good inflection moment. Sometimes you need to have that. So sort of, you know, this is you know, it's been it's been cited as as sort of crypto's Lehman moment, hasn't it? Where it where it's the ability to tighten things up and then bring it more you know more to the fore, which creates in turn, a whole lot of opportunity to do the good stuff and utilize the tech, as we, as we were saying before, about whether really exciting things can happen with, uh, you know, with, with all of this there on. Yeah, I, it's, it's funny. The tech piece of it, I love. I truly love. In order for us to do things like Web 3.0, really have true ledgers going across, everything's accounted for, that's going to be amazing, right? Mm. If we come up if we collectively, the, the global community, come up with a payment system built on crypto and ledgers, and we're just getting the messages to the banks, that, that would be great. But there have been a lot of mouths being fed through a lot of other payment methods for a mm. long time, and yeah. they're going to want to be fed still. So yeah. that's going to force schemes to adopt. You know, I think it's great that Visa says, oh, we can accept USDC. Don't know why, just another currency type that's going to come across on an ISO message. But it's because they want to be a part of it. They need to still get paid somehow. They want to apply. But then, their... but then by the same by the same rationale, that's yeah, that could be said the same for a you know, for a Kodak or a or a or a Blockbusters or or a, you know all of these businesses and Nokia that that uh, you know got disintermediated because they did stand still. And and yeah, you know, my view my, my view is is if you look at institutional banks if you look at visas and and you know, you know we've all been uh, stung by too big to fail beforehand is 
the, the general consensus is, is is that we will we will um, rather than fight this, we'll lean into it and we'll invest in it and we'll we'll do that. And you've seen, you know, Goldman's pumped millions into uh, you know digital assets and such like recently and, and put their, themselves behind it because it's hedging their bets effectively, isn't it, about what the future can you know, look like from it. So I find it really, really interesting. So tell me how how Carter uh, fit into this into this jigsaw and what you guys are, are excited about as we move into uh, into twenty twenty three. Yeah, so there are a couple there are a couple of interesting things with Carter. So core issue processing, we need Visa, we need Mastercard right now. That, those are our two schemas that we work with directly. I mean, we're an API shop that deals with messages, and I'm completely op- oversimplifying that. Right. Um, so we're just a messenger. <laughs> a little messenger. That's our day. Um, you know, the interesting thing for us is we're a cog in a much larger offering. Being an issuer processor as your substrate, you have um, you have to consider who your customer is and who their customer is. Right. So because of the messaging platform that we have, really it's it's going to be the same data coming across through our system. It's how we make our data available. And then more importantly, what does our customer do with our data? You know, how quickly do they get it? Well, via API, it's pretty darn quick, right? What do they do with it from there? And how does that tie to their business? Because it gets down to what do you want the user experience to be? You know, we've done some really innovative stuff with a company um, in Europe um, and they're in multiple countries actually. And their offering has driven us to be innovative. They're like, hey, we really wanted to do this. So us from the product side um, at Carta, it's a matter of they're doing something new and innovative. How can we take in what they want to have done, do it in a way that we can productize, and then potentially turn it into a revenue generator for us. So we're Mm -hmm. looking at a lot of the cutting edge stuff that we've done in in the earlier days of our business. For example, we were the first um, Apple Pay um, processor ever. We flew wow. from Europe to Cupertino and sat in a room with the machine and we actually facilitated the first Apple Pay. So like that kind of bleeding edge That's innovation. Cool, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it was great. And then, you know, MasterCard was doing that and then MasterCard, you know, went off, did their own thing. You know, we were working with TransferWise on multi-purse transactions you know how how when you swipe a card which which account is it going to hit our technology use the regular iso messages that come across iso 8583 messages that come across but at the same time we built layers within ours to access the appropriate wallets right a lot of issuer processors will say oh you want to do that cool we're going to send you the iso message and you tell us which one you want to use. We've done things where we can do that. That's that's every day for us, but also we have it built in. It really is going to come down to what our customers want to build. How much tech lift do they want? How much responsibility do they want? Do we need to bring a partner in for something cool and innovative that they want that really doesn't touch us, but we're it's card adjacent, meaning that we'll issue the card and that service they're talking about still needs a card to access funds. So mm. there are a lot of things that we do as an underpinning or substrate for a value that's offered out to consumers. It's about when do you, what information do you need? When do you call that information? What do you do with that information? And then let's make sure the money moved to where we thought it was going to move. That's really what we're, where we're at, right? Um, so we enable these entrepreneurs or large behemoth companies to come in and really build out new experiences because of the way our API structure works, because of the dynamic characteristics that we have and our willingness to build new innovative products with them. Mm. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And what a dream job for a, t- for a chief product officer, right? Well, it is, well it's never, never boring. Um, well, I can, tell, yeah. I can yeah. tell why you're up at 3.20 in the morning to get involved in all of this. There's, that, 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 I mean, it's just a seismic opportunity, isn't it? In terms of how many different things you can do and where you can take it and, you know, looking at those, oper- I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a product, you know, it's a, it's a pro- product manager's dream, isn't it? it? It really is. I mean, having, having outside companies say, Hey, I have an idea and then come to me and go, how are we going to do this? Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. <laughs> my, ADHD, my ADHD goes crazy. I'm like, oh my God, there are like 37 things we can do right now. And then I want, then, then the grown up in me comes out and I'm like, 
How am I going to resource this? Where are my people? Who's going to invest in this? How am I going to package this? You know, what are, and then there's my 200 item checklist of things that need to happen to make it go. <laughs> and I'm just like, all right, let's go. Sounds good. So I, I get super excited. Like I said, in our preamble, I mean, I'm really thankful for the interview because it gives me an opportunity to, to geek out with people who get it. <laughs> so, yeah. Definitely done that. I could be talking for a long time about this as well, and I get the impression that you could be as well. What I'm going to say and finish up finish up on is is uh, I love the, uh, the the juxtaposition of having someone who is as I've rarely had on this show someone who's more passionate, more excited, uh, more interested in their subject matter, drinking out of a uh, a Mr. A, a, a grumpy mug at the same sort of stage. It's a it's a brilliant it's a brilliant juxtaposition between between the two of you. Um, but lovely, lovely having you on the show. Tell me, who should be reaching out to you and getting in touch? And what's the best way to look for them to do it if they've been watching the show today? I want to find out yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, a couple, a couple of different things. One, go to the website. We have contact sheets on the website. The people who should be reaching out, people who want to enter, enter the market and either they want a card as a product itself or they need a card for the product they're offering. So when I think about B2B businesses that need to make payments, B2B businesses that are facilitating e-com aggregation, travel companies where you have multiple merchants to pay behind the scenes, things like that. Those are all good opportunities for us, as well as um, you know, facilitators that need a consumer product or an employee card, um, all, all of those different realms. That, and that's the nice thing about having an initial processing platform is, as um, flexible as we have is, it's not always directly about the use case that's trying to be achieved because at the end of the day, it's an ISO 8583 message and mm. it's how we present that information. So if you have an idea that requires a card, then we can look at how we can make it work for you, help guide customers um, or potential um, offerings in, in regards to what form factor the card's in, what kind of card is going to give you the best interchange rate, those types of things. And we can really help drive success um, by way of having the most flexible payment apparatus available, you know, because at the mm. end of the day, anything can be tokenized now. So, I mean, my watch, a ring, my phone, my laptop, everything can have a card embedded into it. We generate the card number because at the end of the day, it's, it's about that specific card number and how it's being leveraged. So if folks have ideas they want to expand on, come talk to me. Um, come I'm excited. Talk to me. Uh, what, yeah. no, no, matter, no matter what stage of the day, by the sounds of it as well. It's been absolutely <laughs> fascinating. And, and I love the fact that this is, you know, there's such a clear opportunity in this space. It's such a clear opportunity to do things better and such clear excitement about, um, you know, fi finding a route here that I think makes a genuine, genuine difference in the marketplace. And that's what we love to talk about on, on this show. So it's been a... It's been an absolute pleasure having you on today. Thanks so much for coming on, bo uh, coming on board and, and sharing it. Thanks for geeking out, as you said be be beforehand. Yeah. And, and even, so, even so, when you're geeking out, you're still translating it into a really understandable and, and, and important message as well as it, as it comes through too. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really enjoyed having you on today. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you so much, Shelby. Really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. And thank you all for watching. We will see you very soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.